Thank you, President Engstrom, to the assembled dignitaries here, faculty, staff, family, friends, parents, and uh, most importantly to the graduates of the class of 2016. The world is full of bastards. <laughs> the number increasing rapidly the further one gets from Missoula, Montana. I left Missoula, Montana a long time ago, shortly after my own commencement in May of 1978, and I can vouch for the veracity of that wonderful line from A River Runs Through It by Norman McLean, one of the many notable writers who hails from Montana. I've been many places, I've met many fine people, and I have also encountered what seems to me like more than my fair share of bastards. So it's really nice to be back here where the odds are much more in my favor. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Honestly, when President Engstrom first approached me about the possibility of doing this, I was equal parts honored and intimidated. The honored part, I assume, is self-evident. It may seem odd to some of you that I would be intimidated at this prospect since I'm used to being in front of people, sometimes millions of people on screen. I mean, that is what I do for a living, but there are some big differences between what I do on a daily basis and speaking here today at a commencement ceremony. Here I'm just me. I'm not pretending to be somebody else, and I'm speaking my words, not words that were written for me. Although, to be completely honest, my friend uh, Dan Erickson did, he's out here somewhere. Hey, Dan. He did help me assemble my thoughts into uh, something that may or may not prove to be remotely cohesive. <clears throat> Having said that, he's a bobcat, so forget I mentioned him. <clears throat> Going back to my own commencement, uh, lo, these 38 years ago, I, uh, there was a, a speaker there that day, uh, an educated and wise speaker, I assume. <laughs> I, I honestly have no recollection of who spoke that day or of any nuggets of wisdom they may have dropped. Um, my point being, I guess, that uh, I'm not arrogant enough to think that, uh, that I'm going to change everybody's lives here today or that uh, years from now you will even remember who spoke here today. And believe me, for an actor, it's, you know, it's hard to put aside your ego like that. <clears throat> But I digress, uh, as I will continue to do to a disconcerting extent, I think, as, as we wander along here. Over the years, with, uh, with education and experience, I have gotten to be uh, pretty good and feel pretty comfortable with, uh, with other people's words. But there's a reason that, at my age, I haven't branched out into writing, directing, producing, you know, the, the grown-up jobs. I like what I do for a living. I like my little part of the creative process, which, uh, as I think about it, is not even really creative so much as it is interpretive. Really, I'm a messenger. I'm a, I'm a conduit. The filmmaker, the creative, the real creative genius is the writer or the filmmaker or the composer. Now, I'm realizing Two things. First of all, that I left my reading glasses back up there. <laughs> and I do actually have some notes. <laughs> uh, 
Believe me, graduates, the day you turn 40, you're going to need these. <clears throat> that was one of the big things I learned here at the university, was that, uh, that it's really the creator, the writer, the filmmaker, and, and not so much the performer who is, uh, who is the creative genius. I was uh, studying voice with the late legendary Esther England, and as I was preparing for a, a recital on which I was going to be one of many performers, uh, we were having our last voice lesson rehearsal before that recital, and I sang through the song one last time, and it went well, and, and Esther said, uh, well, how do you feel? Are you, are you ready? Are you prepared? And I said, yeah. And she said, are you nervous? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, which one is it? And I stared blankly, and she said, you've done the work, and you're prepared, so there's no reason to be nervous. And that really sunk into me at that time. It also made me think back to something that my father had said repeatedly about performers and about himself as a conductor when he was being complimented. He would often say, thank you, and then go on to say, but it's, it's not about me, it's not even about the choir that I conducted, it's about Brahms or Mozart or whoever the, the great composer was. So there you go, insight from the voice of experience. Although, honestly, I'm not sure if uh, for young people in the class of 2016, and I'm sure there are some maybe who are not so young in the class of 2016, but by and large, I'm not sure if listening to the voice of experience is what's most helpful, really. I think what is most helpful for young people, for any people, is to do your best to adhere to the principle expressed in these three words. Be here now. And that's as concisely as I think I can put it. Um, and it's something that I continue to tell myself to appreciate the moment, to live life as it is happening, not dwell on the past, not be too anxious about the future, but to do my best to be here now. And by be here, I do simply mean wherever you are physically present, to also be mentally, emotionally, spiritually present. And by present, I, I mean fully engaged and not staring at your damn smartphone all the time. Now, fully engaged doesn't even necessarily have to mean that you're focused on other people or another person. Believe me, you can be fully engaged with a sunset over Flathead Lake, and that can be one of the great experiences of life, whether you're with friends or with your family, with your spouse, or all by yourself. And be all by yourself sometimes. When you're alone, be all by yourself. Clear your mind, put down your phone, as a matter of fact, if you're enjoying that sunset over Flathead Lake, feel free to just <laughs> chuck your phone right in there. Having an, an oral fantasy now of the, the sploosh that that phone would make when it hits the lake. Do that when you're by yourself. Try to clear your mind and just be. It's a wonderful journey that we're all on together in life, and it's best when you're really paying attention to the moment, connecting with other humans, and I urge you not to spend, or more correctly, waste too much of your time playing videos on your iPhone. Just be present where you are. It's simple, really, but it's not easy. It takes practice, and I'm not all that good at it, but I aspire to be, and I'm working on it. And I think we all aspire to something, and that's good, that's important, but aspiration without hard work is really just pipe dreams. 
Here's another quote, not from Norman McLean. <clears throat> if you only do what you can, you will never be more than you are. I'll say that again. If you only do what you can, you will never be more than you are. Kung Fu Panda 3. You never know where a pearl of wisdom will appear, so pay attention, listen. Listening is very important. Now, I did, I, this is a good time for the disclaimer that everything I'm blathering on about here today is, it's all just my opinion, it's just what I think. And, uh, and my opinion is really of no more value than anybody else's, the person on your left, the person on your right. And that even includes your parents. It, uh, it includes the homeless guy under the Higgins Avenue Bridge. And the fact that I'm in the public eye and that I've, uh, I've got some acting trophies uh, doesn't really make my opinion any more valid than your Aunt Katie's. Less so, I think, in fact, because she actually knows you. So maybe better than you think. Me, I'm just another curmudgeon who likes to bitch and moan about how things were better in my day which they were <laughs> before smarty pants phones. And that actually, that reminds me of a book that I read a couple of years ago. One of my favorite things in life so far has been reading to my kids, uh, to our kids actually, because I, I didn't single-handedly create the children in a laboratory. I, I impregnated their mother <laughs> in, in, in the traditional way. <laughs> by, by traditional, I don't mean like page one of the Kama Sutra. I just... <laughs> anyway, yes, reading to kids. I, uh, I really enjoy reading to our children. Uh, to any children, to my nieces and nephews before, uh, before we had our own kids, to my cousin's kids, friend's kids. And, and there's a lot of really great literature out there for kids of all ages, especially if you're willing to go back several decades. From Goodnight Moon or Oh, The Places You'll Go or anything by Dr. Seuss for little kids to The Mysterious Journey of Edward Tulane to the Harry Potter books. Uh, my daughter, our daughter, um, has read all seven of the Harry Potter novels. She's 14 years old. She's read them, the whole series, 14 times. Literally. Dear God, please only use that word, literally, when it actually makes sense. I got, Seriously, if you take nothing else away from my remarks today, <laughs> only use that word correctly. I, I'm guessing that many of you in the graduating class of 2016, if you examine your own speech patterns, you will find that you at least occasionally are guilty of using that word incorrectly or, or at least unnecessarily. So please, allow me to dissuade you from the misuse or overuse of the word literally. The decline and fall of the English language is proceeding along just fine <laughs> without so many of us contributing in that one small way. The vast majority of the time that word is used these days by, yes, I will say it, by your generation, it's at best unnecessary and at worst completely wrong. I was standing in line at a cafe in my neighborhood in LA recently, a year ago or so, and standing right in front of me were two people who happened to be college age, they happened to be female, they happened to be blonde, and they sounded sort of exactly like Moon Unit Zappa in that song, Valley Girl, you know, and um, one of them was saying to the other, um, recounting some story of her with a, with a mutual acquaintance of theirs and how exasperating this guy was. And, and she said, and this is, I quote, 
And I, I couldn't believe it. I literally, I died. Okay, sorry, back to Harry Potter. Um, my daughter, our daughter. Uh, it started with me reading the first Harry Potter book to her when she was maybe seven years old, and I would read a chapter a night, every other night at bedtime. My wife and I had established the tradition of each of us having one of our kids for some one-on-one -on -one bonding time at night. And um, reading that first book to her when she was about seven years old sparked something significant in her her love of storytelling, both as a reader and a writer, which was already evident, uh, really took a big step forward there. But the book that I was thinking about when I started this whole wayward train of thought is called uh, Rascal, A Memoir of a Better Era. It's a story about a boy and a raccoon, and it's uh, uh, almost Mark Twain-ish. It's actually written by, uh, by a writer whose name I wrote down here because I never remember it, Sterling Frost. Um, and it's a great read. Read it to a kid someday, rascal, memoir of a better era. But be warned that uh, for the more sensitive child, it, it, it may prove difficult. So, But read it anyway. Don't skip to the ending and see if they all live happily ever after. I think sometimes we protect our kids too much from, uh, from reality, from the difficulties of life, from, from the Dickensian harshness in, in fiction or in... Uh, in real life, uh, and I'm not sure that we do them a favor when we do that. Obstacles exist in life, and not everybody is nice. Although we should all try to be. Uh, my mom was very fond of saying, especially as I was becoming more well-known and someone would stop me on the street and comment on my work, she would often interject with, uh, he's also a nice man, which is what's really important. Okay, my next pithy quote here. If I'd have known I was going to live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. It's a great line, especially from the perspective of a certain age. And I actually, when I first heard that, I heard that it was attributed to Mickey Mantle, which became sort of sadly ironic when he died uh, in his early 60s. And then someone told me, no, 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 it, it wasn't Mickey Mantle, it was Oscar Wilde is quite a dichotomy. Uh, and uh, I recently looked it up on my smartphone as I was having this internal debate. It was UB Blake who said that. Anyway, take care of yourself is the point. Take care of yourself. Eat your vegetables. Get some exercise. Floss. Use your turn signal. I know that has nothing to do with taking care of yourself. It's just a pet peeve of mine. I <laughs> want to get that off my chest. Be on time. Please have the decency to, the common courtesy, to, to not make people wait for you. Yes, while they're waiting, they can while away the time on their smartphone. Hey, here's an idea. While you're the person waiting for your late friend, instead of pulling out your smartphone to take a picture of frozen dog poo or, or text your other friends about how your other friend is keeping you waiting, take out your telephone and use it to make a telephone call to an old person. Call your mom, call your dad. You may have heard me say something like this before. If you're lucky enough to have one or more parents alive on this planet, call them. Don't text, don't email. Call them on the phone, tell them you love them, and listen to them for as long as they want to talk to you. And it doesn't even have to be your parents. It could be many of you in the graduating class have grandparents, old aunts, uncles, former teachers, coaches, do you know how much it means to them to hear from you and to know that you care enough to be in touch with them and ask how they're doing and share how you're doing with them? Call them. We all come into this life 100% dependent on our parents. We would, we would literally... 
and yes, I, I use that word kind of unnecessarily, but it's at least not incorrectly, to emphasize a point, we would literally have died without our parents nurturing, without being fed, sheltered, clothed. And now fast forward 20 some years in, in many of your cases, and here you are, most of you feeling quite independent from your parents. Maybe not financially, although that would be their fondest wish. <laughs> but you are, by and large, I think feeling some degree of mental, physical, emotional, spiritual independence from your parents. You don't need them anymore. And I think especially guys, I know that's a, a gender-based stereotype, but I, I feel like we tend to cut the cord more thoroughly than our sisters do. That's, it's pure Mars and Venus, I guess. Anyway, my point, yes, I do have one. I want you to consider the possibility that your parents need you. Most of you are at an age where that long transition begins and that's something I think most of us don't realize until we have the opportunity to be parents. And even then sometimes we're so caught up in getting through the day to day that it doesn't sink in. Your parents need you. They are biologically connected to you in a way that you just can't fathom until it's your turn. So, I'll say it again, yes. Call your mom, call your dad. That moment, and I know many of you uh, are familiar with it, and I'm not arrogant enough to assume that all of you are, but at the Academy Awards last year, this was witnessed by millions and millions of people when I talked about calling your mom and dad. and. That may be the single most visible moment of my life, and if that is my legacy, I couldn't be happier about it. As much as I appreciate my agent. Yeah. As much as I appreciate him, and uh, I'm, I'm glad I didn't go up there and just thank him and the producers and the backers and distributors and publicists and yada, yada, yada. They're all wonderful people. Um, it's not true, some of them are real bastards, but... <laughs> anyway, I'm glad I made my 45 seconds in that spotlight about family. I started by talking about my wife and how uh, remarkable she is and about our above average children. But the call your mom, call your dad thing became an an immediate internet sensation, a meme, and uh, more importantly, it had a real effect. It, it, it actually brought estranged families together. Adult children reached out to their parents and reconnected, sometimes in dramatic ways. In at least one instance, I know that a reconnection was established hours before the mother died. She was able to pass or transition or whatever verb you choose finally at peace with her family. And it's, it was really gratifying to have had that kind of effect on people's lives. There was also a friend of mine, a, a, a Montanan, who uh, was among the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who texted or called or emailed uh, uh, after the Academy Awards. And she, uh, she called to, to thank me because the next commercial break after I made that speech, her phone rang and she looked down and, and her son was calling her. And uh, the thing that made her story unique was that her son was sitting right next to her on the couch. <laughs> Just being a smart ass. <laughs> My parents and uh, I know many of you are now conjuring up fond images and memories of my folks, Don and Pat Simmons. But most of you here in the class of 2016, other than Marley Nyland and Hallie Morrison, and probably a few others, probably don't know who they were. And uh, I won't take too much time trying to explain who they were to those of you who don't know them. Suffice to say that during the couple of days I've been here, hundreds 
literally hundreds of people have come up to talk to me and most of them have not come up to talk to me about me and my fabulous show business career. Most of the people that have come up to me today and yesterday and the day before have wanted to talk to me about my parents and about the positive impact that they had on their lives. And that's always my favorite part of coming back to Missoula, Montana and to the University of Montana. My parents didn't often sit us down and preach to us about their philosophy of life. They didn't uh, spew a lot of aphorisms or meaningful quotes or lectures on how to live life. They, like the best team leaders in sports, they led and taught by quiet example, by living life well, by being kind and considerate, by obeying the golden rule, and by using common sense and my wife and I try to do the same with our children. And as we do, we really try to appreciate each moment as it exists. We try to be here now, which is another thing my parents did quite well. I mean, my dad was often fondly mocked for his tendency to plan ahead during every family gathering based exclusively on exactly what food would be consumed, where and when, but other than that and the occasional wistful story from the depression, uh, they mostly did a very good job of, of being here now, my parents, our parents, um, my brother and sister, uh, also University of Montana graduates. Um, our parents lived in the moment quite well. And it's not that tricky, really, I think, when you, when you simplify. Be nice. Listen. Connect. Work hard. Be here now. It's really been, um, it's really been a pleasure for me to be here now. Thank you, President Engstrom, for inviting me. Thanks to all of you for indulging me. And uh, shortly after this ceremony ends, I think most of us will be heading off to other smaller gatherings of family and friends. And when we get there, let's do our best to be there. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Mom and Dad, for having me, literally.